Praise God. All right. Um, tonight, we're going to be continuing with our marriage, love, relationship, and marriage tonight. And tomorrow night, we're going to be concluding. This morning, I have to be a little bit generic in my dealings and try to be all-inclusive because... Um, Let's read a few of the scriptures we have looked at already. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. A man shall leave his father and his mother, and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. We said that the process of relationship begins with the man coming to the place in his life, in his walk with God, in his maturity, where he can exist without the impute of his parents. So the scripture says, for this cause, or for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Many times problems in marriage result from in-laws. In-laws. The guy's mother wants to run the house. It's usually the guy's mother. It's never the girl's mom. It's usually the guy's mom that wants to run the house. And I pointed out yesterday that God gave this instruction before there was any in-law at all. In-laws did not exist when God gave this instruction. So it, it wasn't because of the fall of man that God gave it. It was just something God anticipated. And in the wisdom of Almighty God, this is the only way marriage will work. As long as your parents are involved in the marriage, it will not work. Get your parents out of the marriage. Get your mother out. So the first step is to leave father and mother. Now, I didn't say forsake. You don't forsake your parents. You take care of your parents. You honor your parents. But it is, you are not honoring your parents when they get involved in your married life. You are dishonoring God by allowing them to get involved in your married life. Hallelujah. Am I making any sense? So marriage works when we... See, marriage is not our idea. It's God's idea. None of us slept and woke up and decided to institute marriage. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's purely God's idea. And for it to work, we have to go to God's manual, God's test book. And when we look at God's manual, we're going to have a blissful married life. And we said that the next step is to cleave unto your wife. Cleave means marry, marry, marry. Now, this goes together with the third step, which is they two shall become one flesh. One flesh has to do with the sexual relations in a marriage. Now, notice the sequence. A man leaves his father and his mother. He is joined to his wife in marriage, not joined to his girlfriend, not joined to a side chick. Not joined to his babe. Not joined to his sugar mommy. Joined to his wife. That's the word God used. Joined to his wife. And then he says, they can become one flesh. Now they can have the sexual experience. 
sex outside of marriage is deadly. Now, because you did it, because you did it, and you think you have a good marriage, doesn't mean it, make, make it right. And that does not stop you from teaching your children to do better than you did. And many times, parents are self-righteous. By self-righteous, I mean, oh, uh, I did it, but I turned out all right, so the grace of God will take care of them. No, a thousand times no. You have to hold the standard of God's word for your children. It will shock you. They will imbibe what God said. Am I making any sense? I asked the question. Am I making any sense? So, marriage is sex must come after marriage, not before marriage, and not outside of marriage. Get this and get it. Save yourself a lot of heartache. I'm talking to you, young folks. Save yourself a lot of heartache. There is no person, no person, ask anybody who was involved in premarital sex, who will tell you it's worth it? Ask anybody, if they'll be honest to tell you. They, all of them will tell you, I would have waited. I would have just waited. And that's God's program. And most of the heartaches in relationships come because of sex in the relationship. God did not design any relationship to accommodate sex until that relationship culminates in marriage. It is only in within the boundary of marriage that sex fulfills its purpose. Outside the boundaries of marriage, sex is sour grape. Sour grape. So, God's pattern is for us to wait till marriage before we have sex. Listen, listen. Don't destroy your future before you get started. When you have sex outside of marriage, whether premarital or extramarital, both of them are sour grapes. They set your teeth on edge. Hallelujah. So, sex is confined. The beautiful thing, let's, let's get this first. Let's get this first. Hey, Barista, is that you? <laughs> Happy four years. <laughs> it used to be in my choir and play keyboard for me. And good to see you. Now, what was I saying? <laughs> what? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Barista, I see what you cost. He's raising two hands toward heaven. God, I'm not the one. All right. Sex was ordained by God. You did not ordain it. I did not ordain it. And the most beautiful experience in this world is not taking a flight. It's not going to Dubai. The most beautiful experience in this world is called sex. There is nothing in this world to compare to it. I know some parents tell their children, don't, don't sleep around, though. It's bad. It is not bad, boy. Sign me up for extra, extra classes. You didn't get what I meant by extra classes. Amen. Sign me up for extra time, you know. Sex is the most beautiful experience anybody can have. There's nothing to be compared to it under the sun. Under the sun. Nothing. Nothing to be compared to it. It is the most powerful force in human history. 
There's nothing, nothing in this world can be compared to the ecstasy of sex. Nothing. So telling your children, it's a bad thing, it's a bad thing. You're, you're lying. You're, and by the time they go and they discover it was wonderful, they say, Mom lied. <laughs> Mom is a liar. This thing was cool, man. This thing was cool. I want more. <laughs> and then the mother is eh, eh. says, it's bad. They say, yes, Mom, it's very bad. And they're going for another one. Say the truth. Stop lying to your children. Sex is cool. Sex is good. I tell my kids, chill. This thing is, eh? Ah! This thing your dad saw and didn't look back. So sex is cool. You get what I'm saying? You guys are not smiling at all. Because they told you it's bad. <laughs> and I know in church nobody talks about it. So some of you go in the night. To check it out. <laughs> Yeah, because in church, nobody preaches it. Nobody says it's a nice thing. You know, it's a bad thing. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. It's a bad thing. Let me tell you this. The church of Jesus Christ has done the greatest disservice to the institution of marriage more than any other person. Yes, the church, the church. I'll give you a little history. The church of Jesus Christ has done the greatest disservice to the institution of marriage than unbelievers. In fact, the devil didn't need help when the church entered the arena of marriage and discredited it. Satan started dancing. Because in church, there's one of the church fathers called Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N. He was um, one of the early church fathers, immediately after the apostles. Then in church history, there's people called early church fathers. They're the ones who came on the scene after the apostles died off. Polycarp, Origen, St. Athanasius, several of them. They're the ones called church fathers. Now, Origen had himself castrated because he says sex and marriage is evil. And the only way to escape it was to be castrated. So he had himself castrated. The great St. Augustine refused to marry. The girl he wanted to marry, he threw her out with the son the girl had for him. He said, you cannot fully serve the Lord until you're married, until you are unmarried. So the church associated marriage and sex with badness and evil. Now, I ask you guys a question. The God who serve, what is he called? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and? Uh, come on, answer me. The God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said, this is my memorial forever. This is how I want to be known forever. Was Abraham a single man? What about Isaac? What about Jacob? They were all married. And you can never be spiritual enough to outdo Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can never do it. Born your body for God, you will never get to where Abraham is. So you can never be more spiritual. Nothing you can do in this world will make you be called. The, we make God be called the God of you. And he will say, this is my memorial forever. It will never happen. That is Abraham's prerogative. And Abraham was married. So there's nothing wrong with marriage. I didn't hear you. And there's nothing wrong with sex in marriage. You're not enjoying what I'm teaching. Can I get a strong amen? amen? All right. Years ago, a man, I heard someone say, um, Apostle Ayo Babalola of CAC, was, he said, he was talking about what it means to be deeply spiritual, the price this man paid to carry the anointing of God. And then he said, even Ayo Babalola did not have time to have children with his wife because he was busy fasting and praying on the mountain. Now, I believe the story. And I was in my head trying to equate it. And I said, God has never asked me to study any man and follow any man in a particular direction without the man having the marriage, marriage thing together. Because in 2002, the Lord gave me a vision about marriages. 
and told me to do something about it. And I left that. I didn't bother with it. So I agreed that Babalola did not have a, married a wife, but did not have children because he was in hot pursuit of the power of God. Hallelujah. Mm. Mm. So, only to discover it was all lies. In fact, the man had four children. Had four children. And his daughter is alive. She has an interview on YouTube. She said, if you see my dad with mom, they are like babies, lovers. I say, yeah. And do you know you don't have four children on the mountain? Where do you have them? In the bedroom. Why are you not talking? There's no mountain for four children. You want children, leave mountain and move to the bedroom. That's where you have children, in the bedroom, not on the mountain. Yeah, if you are there, you are telling God, I want children. Say, my friend, go, 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 leave this mountain, go home. And go and have your children. That's where you have children, in the bedroom, not on the mountain. Praise God. So when you are done with your mountainous activities, you must return to the bedroom. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Victor. Thank you. Some people, you know, this kind of talk in church is new to some of you. Because, oh, we don't talk like this in church. Welcome to my world. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Let me show you a few scriptures. Because Colossians chapter 2, we read verses 16 to 23. I have a good married life. I'm not hearing you. I have a good married life. I enjoy myself in my married life. Put it up, verse number 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Don't let anybody judge you. Next verse, please. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Next verse, please. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Next verse, please. And not beholding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increased with the increase of God. Verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Verse 21. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Verse 22. Which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Verse 23 is our last. Then he says, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship? For instance, those who say, it's wrong to have a wife. It's wrong. You must give up the pleasures of this world in order to be holy unto God. He says, he says here, it has, it has indeed a show of wisdom in will, worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, but not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. He tells you, it is worthless. It's worthless. There's nothing wrong with the joys of marriage. There's nothing wrong with the bliss of marriage. There's nothing. It glorifies God. God decided. God ordained it. God said, hey, hey, hey. Adam was minding his business. The guy was Tarzan. The guy was running around. Okay, you don't know who Tarzan is. Don't bother. Adam was the first Tarzan in the Bible, in the world. He was just running around, climbing trees with animals. When monkey climbs, he joins monkey. A lion roars, and I say, you are like your teeth, your teeth. That is very sharp. He was just running around. And one day God said, name all the animals. The guy finished naming them. He found out they are all in twos, male and female. He said, but there's no, I'm the only one. I'm enjoying myself. And God said, it is not good that man should be alone. God said, it is not good. Then you tell, you tell God. It is good for you to be alone. You're a rebel. <laughs> Praise God forever. 
Yeah. That's why I said the church has helped to destroy the cause of God in the earth through marriages. Because we associate asceticism or celibacy to holiness. We ascribe celibacy to holiness. And then when somebody is married, we tell ourselves they can't be holy. Why that is complete? Op- My question is, can you be as holy as Abraham was? And Abraham was married. Now, raise your right hand. Say, marriage is a good thing. No, shout it. Marriage is a good thing. Shout it, marriage is a good thing. thing. Hallelujah. The great reformer, Martin Luther, who was a monk, when he started the reformation, after a while, he got married to a young lady. (laughs) And he had some beautiful things to say about marriage. He says, first of all, he had six children with his wife, monk, monk. Monk. He has six children with his wife. And he says, There is no more lovely, friendly, and charming relationship, communion, or company than a good marriage. There's no more than a good marriage. Then he went further to say, Let the wife make the husband glad to come home. And let him make her sorry to see him leave. And then he says again, one should not regard any estate as better in the sight of God than the estate of marriage. One should not regard any estate as better in the sight of God than the estate of marriage. Say, so don't regard any better in the sight of God than the estate of marriage. Anybody who tells you that marriage diminishes holiness and spirituality does not have a clue what he's talking about. Does not have a clue what he's talking about. And anybody who believes that the sexual experience in marriage diminishes spirituality does not know what he's talking about. Has no clue what he's talking about. All right. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 4. Hebrews 13 and verse number 4. Please pay attention. Let's read. It says, marriage is honorable in all. Everybody say in all. all. Everything about marriage is fantastic. It's honorable. And the bed undefiled, but warmongers and adulterers, God will judge. Warmongers are sexually loose people. And adulterers, you know what that is. He said, God will judge them. Now, get this. He said, marriage is honorable in all. Let's define the word honorable. Because that word is found in four places in the Bible, in the New Testament only. It's not found anywhere else. Now, let me show you how the word is used. Because it's going to elevate this marriage in your sight. For you to appreciate it the way God wants us to appreciate the institution of marriage. Now he says, marriage is honorable, honorable, honorable. The word honorable is also translated as precious. The word also means precious. It is the same word that is rendered precious in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19. Put it up for us. 1 Timothy 1 and verse number 19. Shout hallelujah. He says, holding faith um, sorry, First Peter 1 verse 19. Thank you. First Peter 1 verse 19. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. Thank you. First Peter 1. It's a but, but, um, give me verse 18 first. 18 first. Thank you. For as much as you know that ye are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, Received by tradition from your fathers. Verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ 
as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The word precious is the same Greek word translated honorable. And notice where the word precious is used. He calls the blood of Jesus Christ precious. So he's trying to intimate you that marriage is as precious in the sight of God as the blood of Christ. Outstanding. Outstanding. Now look at another place the word is used. It will shock you. It will shock you. Now let's go to Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. It will shock you. It says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these he might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What are precious promises? The word of God. And that word precious there is the same word translated honorable where marriage is concerned. So marriage is suddenly elevated to a place where it is precious as the word of God is precious. Remarkable. Remarkable. Beautiful thought. Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ came on earth, the first miracle he did, which John, the beloved, called signs. John never called them miracles. He called them signs in the Gospel of John. A sign is something that points to something. We have a little book called Pointers, where I elucidated those miracles Jesus did in the Gospel of John. Now, he's, he, calls, he calls all the miracles Jesus performed in his book, in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, he calls them signs. A sign points you to something. A sign tells you something more, shows you something more. So the first sign, the first miracle Jesus ever performed to show proof that he is from God was not to raise the dead. First proof to show that I am from God, I am God, I am God, and God sent me. First proof of that was to turn water into wine in a marriage seminar, in a marriage meeting. To to put a stamp of approval on the importance of the marriage institution. And the church has trampled it on. Because religion told us that marriage is bad, sex is bad. Sex is bad outside marriage. Inside marriage, bros, have fun. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. We're going to be reading, go straight to verse 9, please. I wanted to start from verse 1, but it's going to be a little bit. Uh, Go to verse 1, please. Let's start from verse 1. I think that may help us. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. Verse number two. It said, and great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. Verse three. The Pharisees came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Not male and male. Not Adam and Steve. It it blows my mind how a man can... (laughs) One day... I think it was Brother Jeff that was at the back there. And I think they went witnessing and came back. And one guy came with them or was passing and came in. And the guy sat with him and was telling him how handsome he was. I was right. I said, you, Jeff, somebody told you you're handsome. (laughs) The guy was actually into homosexuality. And he was seeing Jeff. <laughs> Why are you people laughing? If you are involved in that, you are delivered in Jesus' name. Amen. 
that devil that devil goes out of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be free from that evil spirit. Amen. The question is, what are you looking for in a man? What has he got? What has a man got that you are interested? You are telling you're fine. What, what for? Where will you touch? Everywhere is bone. <laughs> Everywhere you touch is bone. Bone and hairs. What are you looking for? I said you are delivered. Amen. You are delivered in Jesus' precious name. So he says, for this, give, give us a seal. He said, he answered unto them and said, have you not read that which, no, go back to, okay, made them male and female. He that, uh, he which made them, made them male and female. Now he says in verse 5, for this cause, what cause? The cause of marriage. For this cause, the cause of marriage. The cause of marriage. For this cause. Shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh? Jesus reiterated that again. For this cause, a man shall leave father and mother. Listen, listen. I know, I know your mom was your only mother and your father. Listen, you must leave him, leave her in order for your marriage to succeed. If not, you will have problems. And the joy of marriage will become the misery of marriage. Because there are prescriptions on how to make it work. If you don't take the prescription on how to make it work, it will not work. You're going to have a hard time. You ask your mom, what rice should we buy? I want to take my wife out. Which restaurant should I take? Must you take her out? Is there no book around your house? Because she can't stand you take care of your wife. She would rather have you take care of her. What about her own husband? It's the job of her husband to take care of her, not your job. Now, yours is to honor her, but honoring her is not that. It's not that running you. It's not, it's not her running you. But I know, I know what my parents suffered for me. I know what they suffered. It is their joy and their prerogative to suffer for you. If not, they are not parents. Parents make sacrifices for their children. They're not the first and they're not going to be the last. And that's their joy. They have fulfilled their destiny and their ministry in giving their child a better life. Now they must get out of the way. Let the kids move forward. Can I get a strong amen, somebody? Now you may not. If you can't say amen, say oh me. Get out of the way. Especially you ladies. What you will not tolerate in your own house. You will try to do it to another person. What kind of terrible seed are you sowing? Encourage the ministry of marriage. Back off. They will make it. Amen. I said they will make it. Amen. Yeah, you're not hearing me. I said they will make it. Amen. And don't forget, they will turn out better than you. Amen. All I know is that nobody can marry my son the way I can handle. You want to marry your son? Go and wear a wedding gown. Wear a wedding gown, come to altar. Go and wear a wedding gown. Come to altar. Are you sure that gear can treat my son very well? God is your helper. Amen. A stronger amen. Amen. All right. So Jesus put his stamp of approval on marriage. He, he elevated it. He said, gentlemen, gentlemen, shut up. In the beginning, it was not so. God made them male and female. And for this cause, 
a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, welded inseparably to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Then they enter the sexual union of one flesh. Sexual union of one flesh. One day I was praying here, and words started to bubble up in my spirit. I said, I heard the voice of the Lord ask me, what did I say about marriage in the Bible? I said, Lord, you said so many things. Help me to answer you appropriately. Which area are you talking about? He said, in Genesis, what did I say? I said, okay, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his cliff unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. I said, what would they be? He said, one flesh. He asked me, what does one flesh mean? I said, it means sexual union in the marriage. He said, good. He said, good. Then he said, sex in marriage is the glue that holds marriage together. He said, the more you apply that glue, the stronger your marriage. And the less you apply it, the less your marriage will be strong. I've noticed when couples come to me with marriage problems, I first ask, when was the last time you had sex? And you will usually hear things like, it's been two weeks, one month, then my prescription first. No, no, it doesn't matter what they say. My husband is an idiot. My wife is a foolish woman. Like, calm down, calm down. Go home, have sex, then come back and let me know how foolish he, both of you are. And this is, this is what I found out. They have never come back. <laughs> See this? There is none that has returned. And these are people that withdraw daggers. In my, pre- my holy presence. <laughs> Some time ago, I was sitting over here with a particular couple. They came, they are not really part of here, but they came. And all they were shouting. And the, the husband said, you are not even afraid. In the presence of a holy man of God, you are shouting. Then the girl said, sorry, man of God. Then she reduced her voice. Then the man raised his own. <laughs> I, said, I said, this man could not match the battle. <laughs> so he used me to intimidate the girl. So the girl said, you that just told me I was shouting in the presence, you are the one shouting. Ah! <laughs> the man just went calm immediately. <laughs> and with all that shouting and screaming, I said, calm down, calm down. They calm down. I said, young man, when was the last time you had sex with this woman? Hmm. The woman said, ask him, oh. <laughs> ask him. Ask him. Ask him. Thank you, man of God. Ask him. Ask him. And he said, uh, I, uh, she said, ask him. Ask him. But every time I touch her, she will turn her back. She said, leave me. Don't touch me. I said, well, it's okay. Uh, Do you know what I want two of you to do? We will continue this discussion. And please, come prepared for greater fight. Because we will settle this thing. If it takes me clearing all the chairs in church, so you people will fight it out. It will be very nice. But go home. Will two of you do what I ask you to do? Yes. Now, hold your wife's hand. I said, now two of you go home and have sex. Make love to each other. Then return tomorrow and come ready for fight. See, today I've not seen them. (laughs) See, today I've not seen them. All they were doing me, testing me. Sorry, man of God, we can't come or we're busy. I said, I know you're busy. (laughs) You're busy. You're busy. Very, very busy. Oh, yeah. Why wouldn't you be busy? How can you have time for man of God when, when you are busy? <laughs> yes, when you are busy. That is what it does. That's what it does. So it's foolishness not to what God gave you. You are staying up. I have more to say about that, maybe in the night. But are you blessed? I'm not hearing you guys. Okay. So marriage is honorable, right? Precious in the sight of God. The same word is used for the blood of Jesus Christ. The same word is used for the word of God. These are the two most precious things in our faith in Christianity. Yet, marriage is referred to with the same adjective. He said, marriage is precious, honorable in all. Everything that has to do with marriage is honorable. 
and he says, and the marriage bed undefiled. We're going to leave that for evening. Marriage bed undefiled. We'll leave it for evening. Now, let's look at nine reasons why you should get married. If you're married, use this to refresh your marriage life. Am I making sense? Brother Prince, are you listening to me? Are you here with me? Are you getting me clear? Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Number one reason. Number one, God wants you to get married. God wants you to get married. Oh, but I've suffered many hearts. Hey, 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 hey. Just allow yourself. If, if you agree with God, God will send you another person better than the first person. Yes, God wants you to be. Marriage, God wants it. He encourages it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help suitable or meet for him. So God said, it's not good to be alone. So God wants you to be married. Don't forget, Martin Luther was a monk. And he discovered God's will. He denounced all his vows and went and got married. So if you have made any vow of celibacy, I command you to denounce it today. Amen. And go and marry in Jesus' name. Amen. God commanded marriage. God told people, go and marry. God funded marriages. God performs miracles in marriages. So marriage is the perfect will of God. Any other thing is not the will of God. What about being single to serve the Lord? First, it is not the will of God. That's not God's original plan. God's original plan is go get married. Number two. Through marriage, the man gains a helper in life. And the woman has the opportunity to help her husband. The same scripture we read. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Through marriage, a man gains a helper in life. Permanent helper. Permanent helper in life. Permanent helper. And the woman has the opportunity to help the man. To exercise the ministry of wifehood and motherhood and every other hood she has to perform. Praise God. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. He says it's not good for man to be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So man gains a helper. Lifetime helper in marriage. Lifetime helper in marriage. That's why he should get married. Number three. Marriage helps you stay focused in life. Stay focused in life and move forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 9. Marriage helps you stay focused in life. Some people are not focused. Not focused at all. They are gallivanting everywhere. They look at one woman. Look at Some of them, they are on Facebook sizing up girls. For, for days, for weeks, for years. For months. They, are, they say, I have not married. Ha, I need to check out girls on Facebook or Instagram. Don't you know there's no girl there that is real? Don't you know that? There's nobody there that is real. Even you that is there. Is it your worst picture you put there? It's the one you went to studio and did. That is not the real you. So don't, don't go there. You don't find wives on Facebook or Instagram. You find them in church. Say a big amen, somebody. Come to church. And in church... We pray with our, wide, our eyes wide open because the master instructed us to watch and pray. Marco Tobaya, Zizele Ah, Maligo Daba, this sister is good. Lipa Tobaya, that's how it's done. Watch and pray. Pray with your eyes wide open. Mi laba daba daba daba. She kalaba. Libele Shaya. Si tabaya dube yada. Hey, what's the name of that sister? You are, you are acting according to the will of God. 
Somebody said that's Kana. It is not Kana. Watch and pray. Is it not in your Bible? Praying with your eyes closed doesn't help. Especially when you're praying for a wife. You pray with it wide open. She is a lover. She is a lover. She is a lover. She is a lover. Somebody said, why are you looking around? I'm looking for wife. I'm looking for wife. Mitawa, Soto, Line, Grida, Sita, 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 Sita. That way you will also see those who are wearing rings. He said, don't go here. Don't go here. And she raises her hand. She's married. Hey, remove your face. But if you're praying with your eyes closed and you're hearing voice, he said, that girl has a nice voice. Hey, she's her now. And she's somebody's wife. You see, that's why you open your eyes in prayer. Watch and pray. Thank you, Jesus. Scriptures are helping us here, right? Yes. So marriage helps you stay focused in life. Once you marry, then you can close your eyes in prayer. Somebody say you used to open eyes before when you pray. Now your eyes are closed because I'm married. I'm focused now. I'm focused. I'm focused. Oh, Jehovah. Mm. 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 If you open your eyes, you see a sister, you close it back. Now I'm not supposed to open my eyes. Marriage gives you focus. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. It said, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. So once you marry, you stop burning. You are now focused. You are now focused. Number three. Number four, thank you. Marriage grants you supernatural favor. Supernatural favor comes into your life when you get married. Supernatural favor. Some of you are just, just nobodies in life. When you walk on the street, everybody thinks you are useless. But once you get married, one, they will change your title. Yes, when I got married, people started calling me Oga, Oga Pastor, Oga Reverend. Yes, that's what they started calling me. All through my neighborhood, ah, I said, Oga Reverend is Oga Pastor, is Pastor. Uh, Oga was added to it. Before then, that young boy who is a pastor. But the moment I married, or God was added to it. Change of status. Supernatural favor. Yeah, some of you look at you. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22. What does he say? Proverbs 18 verse 22. Please hurry up. He said, Whoso findeth a wife find it a good thing and obtain it favor of the Lord. So there are favors you cannot have until you marry. Uh, that is the honest truth. Prayer will not give it to you. Fasting will not deliver it. There are certain favors in life that only marriage will deliver it to you. Sometimes I talk with some young men, Reverend, I need to break, break through, break out. I need, I need to move forward. I said, have you married? No, go and get married first. And so many of them, over 90% of them, the moment they get married, they just see the thing break. They just see the thing break. Because marriage comes with supernatural favor. Comes with supernatural favor. Shout hallelujah. Hmm. Hmm. Number, number five. Mm. Marriage gives you access to unhindered sex. Unhindered sex. Unhindered, unhindered pleasurable sex. Unhindered, I mean, watch, watch the language. Let's read a few things. Unhindered. Unhindered. We read Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. That means they will have the sexual experience. Then 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. We read from verse 3 to 5. 
He said, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Verse number four. The wife had not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband had not power of his own body, but the wife. This is revolutionary. Yes, yes, yes. In Bible days, what Paul was insinuating was madness. It wasn't done. How can a woman have power of of the husband's body? It's not done. This is revolutionary thinking. All the women in Corinth loved Apostle Paul when he wrote this. This guy is truly called of God. Because this was not normal. This was not. Women were a plaything of men's emotions. They, they just used them. They have many. It's not so you are not special. And here Paul is saying, you, you have access to your wife unhinderedly. And then she must also have access to you. The men were like, what is he talking so it's no longer when you want it. When she also wants it, it must be available. You can't say you have a headache. <laughs> yes, scripture, scripture. He said, the woman has no power of her own body, but the man, what does he mean have power? He's not talking about submission, he's talking about sex. And the man had no power of his own body except the woman. Remarkable. Let's finish. Let's finish. He said, defraud you not one the other. Defraud he calls staying away from each other for any good reason under heaven. He calls it defrauding, stealing from each other. That's what he called it. Now, the only, the only condition he says to stay away is not any reason. I am tired today. That is not in the Bible. I'm trying to help you for your marriage to work. Listen, years ago, before we got married, there's a book I got. I read the book. Ah, it intoxicated me. So I called my wife and I said, I, I discipled her a lot with books. So I said, read this book. We're going to discuss it. These were writings of um, wives of top ministers in the world. About seven or eight of them. Top ministers in the world. Their wives what they wrote about their experiences and their their marriage experiences. Every single one of them said, said, I've never denied my husband sex. I said, you must read this book. (laughs) Read this book. Read this. Read it. Read it. Read it. Read it. Read it very well. And she read it. I said, did you finish it? Yes. Did you understand what they said? Yes. That must be our experience. He said, I would like to give myself to you. I said, this thing, this one they said, is our experience. I have never denied my husband. I've never said no to my husband. And to date, I have never been said no to. You don't want to clap for me. Don't want to clap for me. Now, I heard Casey Price say, he was teaching on family. He said, in his church, he said, Betty is here. He said, I am so well taken care of sexually at home by this woman. This woman, oh my, 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 my. And she almost wanted to fall down and die. Yes. So, let me finish, let me finish. Today, repentance is granted you. Yeah. All this, some of you have said more no's than yes. Today, you are forgiven. Yeah. No, you are not hearing me. I say you are forgiven. Yeah. Yes. Receive forgiveness. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, so that's what women use. That's their weapon. The day they didn't get the money they wanted, they just go on strike. Lock the gates of paradise. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you say. He said, we have to sort out that issue first. And the man is not ready to sort out that issue. He just wants to have his wife. Hey, no, 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 no. Can you trust me when we have not discussed the quarrel? Let us finish first. You see that the quarrel will just die. There was no quarrel in the first place. And some people are so petty. We must finish discussing. We must finish. Have we now finished? Yes, uh, it's not now, tomorrow. Yeah. 
Jehovah is your helper. Amen. A stronger amen will help. Amen. Now let's read on. Let's read on. Let's read on. He said, defraud ye not one the other. Notice the only reason. Except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Except it be for, with consent for a time. A time. A time. A time. A time cannot be more than one week. According to scripture, a time, the, the phrase a time means one week. Somebody asked me during the 21 days we are fasting, Daniel fast. He said, Can I touch my wife? I said, You didn't ask me, can I eat? You didn't ask me, can I break the fast? What kind of stupid question is that? If your wife complains, you have me to answer to. Is how you understand, Reverend. No, for a time, if we're doing partial fast, it is partial fast. Once we are done with partial fast, every other normal occurrence of life must continue. And let me tell you, sex does not disrupt spirituality or fasting. The only reason he said two of you is for a time, by seven days, <laughs> boy, everybody's tired. So he said, for a time. So if you're doing a short fast, and two of you can handle, you go ahead. It doesn't stop anything. It doesn't make you less spiritual. It doesn't make you that you didn't receive from God. Do you know, do you know how they worshipped idols in Corinth? They had temple prostitutes. You want to worship, you come and sleep with a prostitute. That is worship. You don't give anything. Just come, sleep with a prostitute. You get up and go. You have worshipped. That's what sex is. And we believers now take it in the sight of God. It's something very bad, very dirty. Hey, no, no, I can't, can't go there. can't go there. can't go there. Let's continue. So defraud not one another, except it be with consent. And this time with consent. If the man takes off and says there's emergency in the spirit realm, and the wife says there's no emergency, come. Then you must end the fast. If you continue the fast, it is no more God you are worshipping. People don't get these things. Say, that woman is of the devil. Each time I want to fast, that's when she's, she's tapping on me. Or my husband, my husband there, eh? my husband is not spiritual at all. Whenever I set out time to minister to the Holy Ghost. And that's when my husband is calling my name. If you listen to the Holy Ghost, he will tell you, go. What you're about to do is part of ministering to me. That's what the Holy Ghost will tell you. That's what the Holy Ghost will tell you. You're no more spiritual than God. Can I get a strong amen? Yeah. And this is, this is how people get into nonsense. Get into nonsense. I don't, I don't know why my husband is now doing pornography. What, where have you been since? Look at what God said. Do not defraud one another. Except be for a time that you give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Outside of that, there is no other congent reason. For staying away from each other. There's no other reason. Next scripture. Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5. We're looking at number 5, right? What did we say it is? In marriage, you have unhindered access to sex which is pleasurable. Good. Now, let's read... <laughs> A, uh, some people are rejoicing, some are not happy. I don't know why, but just go and get married. You may join us and be happy. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 5. <laughs> Proverbs 5, come on, hurry up. Verse, verse 18. Proverbs 5, verse 18. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Hallelujah. Next verse, next verse, next verse. 
Next verse. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee. How many times? No, you're not reading. You're not reading. You're not reading. How many times? Is this in the Bible? How many times? What does all times mean? You know, somebody answer me. What does all times mean? Unhindered. Shalabaya. Elebodoba. Sinagadoya. You know, my, my grand aunt I lived with, sometimes she would carry Bible with her glasses. She said, Bible is complete. <laughs> she said, Bible is complete. Everything is there. Now I agree with her. Everything is there. Let's continue reading. Let her breast satisfy thee at all and be thou ravished. How many times? Always with her love. What does always mean? Every time. Thank you. Every day. Two times a day. Three times a day. Four times a day. Only some people are clapping for me. Guys, when you are done, send me a gift. I just changed your married life. (laughs) Now, listen. The key is to, oh, this is what scripture says. I'm going to do it. Or, I don't care. You will remain unhappy. Trust and obey. For there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. That's it. At all times, always shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number six. Marriage makes you a better, makes you better and more powerful. Marriage makes you better and more powerful. It makes you better and more powerful. Marriage makes you better and more powerful. If you marry God's way. Now, remember our scripture we read in the book of Proverbs. Uh... Eighteen verse twenty two, please put it up for me. Proverbs eighteen twenty two. Hurry up. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. He finds a good thing. Then let's read Ecclesiastes chapter four and verse nine. If you find a good thing, you become better for it, isn't it? All right. Ecclesiastes chapter four and verse number nine. It said, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. So if you get married, you become a better person. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. So suddenly two of you are better for it. Marriage shouldn't leave us worse. It should leave us better. Better. I'm hearing some preachers preach the glory of singlehood. I say, where did you get that in the Bible? 32 reasons why you should remain single. Kenneth Higgins said, I heard him this morning say something, that a man of God who, was, who had worldwide acclaim said in his presence, in a meeting he was in, the man said, Longevity is an Old Testament promise and not a New Testament promise. Bro Higgins, he almost fell out of his seat. He said, doesn't this man read the Bible? This man has a world acclaim. Is this what he's teaching people? He said, Ephesians chapter 6, is it not in the Bible? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is... And he said, for this is the first commandment with a promise that it might be well with you on earth and that your days on earth might be long. Is that not New Testament? And the guy said it's not the New Testament. It belongs only to the Old Testament. What about Second Peter? He that must love life and see good days. Let him reframe his mouth. Is that not longevity? And the guy said he doesn't belong to us in the New Testament. So we can die anytime. And he died anytime. 
And Hagin lived and lived and lived until he was done. With long life, you are satisfied. Yeah. Now, it's the same thing in marriage. Some people say, oh, oh, you just, God said, God said. They're not smarter than God. But my experience has taught me that marriage is bad. You are marrying it the wrong way. Go to the manual. There's a manual for marriage. If you read the manual and follow the prescription of the manual, you will have bliss. There is no place marriage is described in scripture with painful words. Everywhere marriage is talked about in scripture is ecstasy. So, number seven. Am I correct? Are we in number seven? Uh, are you sure we're number seven? In marriage, we demonstrate the mystery between Christ and the church. Through marriage, we acknowledge and demonstrate the mystery between Christ and the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. Please put it up. Let's hurry up with this. Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Go ahead, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Carry on. So ought men to love their wives as to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. He that loveth his wife loveth who? Himself. himself. So he that hated his wife hated himself. Hated himself. Hated himself. Next, please. I hate that woman. Oh, you hate yourself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. Look at it. But nourished it and cherished it, even as the Lord, the church. So what do you do with your wife? You nourish your wife. You cherish your wife. You nourish your wife. You cherish your wife. I used to tell, uh, I saw this young man once. He was wearing a new suit. I said, wow, you look sharp. He said, yes, Reverend, I just bought it. I said, I hope you bought five for your wife. You buy one for yourself, you chatter five for her. That's how you do it. And he, he shuddered. I said, if not, you won't have a happy life. Or, ha, heat is waiting for you at home. <laughs> he married a good girl. So you take care of yourself. You buy one shirt for yourself. You go and buy five or ten for your wife. Somebody said 20. Yeah. Huh? That is now <laughs> bankruptcy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Praise God. So you buy one shoe for yourself. You know, one, one this thing said, give a girl a shoe and she will conquer the world. I don't know if it's true. <laughs> yes, I read it in the shoe store. Outside the country, the post said it's very like give a girl a shoe, give a girl shoes, and she will conquer the world. I said, Who made the quote? They said, We don't know, but we just put it there. <laughs> and all they sell there are female shoes. So give a girl shoes, and she will conquer the world. So you buy one shoe, you chatter shoes for your wife. I didn't say for your girlfriend. I said, For who? Your wife. You buy a car, you guys own only one car. Make sure she's the one driving it. And you, you are tricking. And God, and God will be very happy with you. I'm telling you. God will love you. He will take care of you. He, God, God will be like, this boy. This boy is doing well. Yes. Some of you, your wife is going to the market. She has to tie something around her hair. Cellophane bag to cover. And you, you are driving. Driving. Say, madam, have you gone to the market? Have you cooked? And you are the one cruising, and she's carrying an umbrella, to, trying to avoid rain to go. No, you enter the rain, and she drives the car. Yeah. 
And when you believe for a new car, and the new car comes, you give her the nicer car, and you take the rickety one. Never use a better cell phone than the one your wife is using. You're not a good husband if you do that. Every time you use the latest phone, and then you give the old one to your wife. And I just bought a new phone. Take this one. I love you. 419 love. (laughs) Sorry about that. Always give the best to your wife. Because she is your glory. Ay, 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 ay. Ay. She's your shine, shine, baby. Some of you, if we, if we check your phone and your wife's phone, yours is better. He said, I love using good phones. He said, each time I call her, she doesn't pick. Because each time she wants to pick, the thing goes off. <laughs> and you are fuming, you are angry. Why do I keep calling you? You don't pick my call. What are you always doing when I call? You are calling with a sharp phone. She's using one that's not working. She can't even see the number on the screen. So I'm learning. Good. So let's finish Ephesians, where we are. He said, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord the church. Verse 30. Verse 30. Oh, thank you. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. Verse 31. Go on. He said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Paul again shouted it. Verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Marriage is about Christ and the church. It's a mystery that we can only demonstrate to this world. We can't preach it by having good marriages. And the world doesn't understand it. But Christ and the church is staring them in the face. The mystery of Christ and the church is staring them in the face. Later on they will understand that's what it's about. Number seven. Number what? What did we say number eight is? Through marriage, you give birth to godly seed. Malachi chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. Through marriage, you give birth to godly seed. Through marriage, you give birth to what? Godly seed. Now, let's read Malachi chapter. Yes, he said, yet ye say, wherefore? Because the Lord had been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet... Is she thy champion, thy companion, sorry, and the wife of thy covenant? I heard somebody say marriage is not a covenant. It's not a covenant. Marriage is an agreement. It's not a covenant. And he's a pastor on the pulpit trying to correct everybody. What is this scripture doing in the Bible? Next verse. And did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Why did God allow us to get married? One of the reasons is that he may have a godly seed. Raise your hands, your wombs are open. You are producing godly seeds everywhere. Any child born in a union of husband and wife becomes a godly seed. A side of marriage is not a godly seed. Now, it doesn't mean they can't get saved and serve the Lord. But what, what God wanted in marriage was godly seed. Husband and wife who have taken vows now produce godly seed. That's your portion. Yes. How many have I given you? Please, Please give me number one. God wants you to get married. Next one. All right. Number t- no, the next one. Next one. Next one. 
Yes, next one. No, okay, finally, finally, number nine. Marriage protects you from the temptation of fornication and adultery. Marriage protects you from the temptation of fornication and adultery. First Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 and, and 9. Please hurry up. It says, Defraud ye not one another, the one, one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Satan tempt you not. So a vibrant, robust, married life with active sexual life stops you, keeps you from temptation of fornication and adultery. It stops you from that. Scripture says that Satan tempts you not. Next scripture. Uh, give me verse 9. Give me verse 9. He said, for if they cannot contain it, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. So you see that marriage is now the boundary to contain a man's burning, burning passion. It's contained within the context of marriage. But if it's burning without that containment in marriage, what happens? Oh my, he burns down everything. Proverbs chapter 5. 18 to 20. Verse 20, please get it for me in easy to read translation, easy to read version. But give me King James first. Verse 20, I want it in easy to read version and we close. But give me King James. No, give me King James from verse 18, 18 to 20. 18. Proverbs chapter 5, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18. Proverbs 5, 18. Thank you. He said, let, the, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Verse, 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 verse 19. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. Verse 20. Hallelujah. Verse 20. And why will thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Now give it to me in easy to read version. Verse 20. Easy to read version. I'm waiting for you guys, please. 